This is our open event for the month of March. Yes, that's right. From ritual to effect, from habit to ritual, harness the surprising power of everyday actions with the one and only Michael Norton, who has no glasses there, but now has glasses on. He said it's a filter. I believe him. His new book's out on Simon & Schuster. Um, But before we tell you all about Michael, let me tell you about Irrational Labs. If you don't know about us, we do three things. One, we do consulting. That's our bread and butter. We have a lot of fun doing it. Two, we do research. You interested in what the best people in the field are doing? Reach out to us. We can do a lit review for you that will blow your mind. And lastly, we do learning and development and training. That includes our community stuff like this, corporate uh, training and boot camps. With that, um, we've worked with hundreds of top organizations to bring behavioral design to their processes. If we were superheroes, which we are not, but if we were, our origin story, story would start almost a decade ago at Google where we founded the Behavioral Economics Business Unit and worked with over 25 teams to design and test interventions. Since then, we've run over 100 experiments and trained thousands of folks in the basics of behavioral design. Um, With that, oh my gosh, I'm going to go back one second. With that, there wasn't enough drama there. I'm sorry. Kristen has known Michael for over 10 years, and she wanted to give him the full, completely dramatic intro. So with that, Kristen, tell us about Michael. Yeah, I like the um, I like that it's going to be dramatic, and um, I'm gonna and that puts a lot of pressure. Um, so I uh, yeah, so Mike uh, Norton has um worked with, collaborated with, been hanging out kind of in the scenes of Irrational Labs for a very long time. Um, my goal here is actually to get Mike to say Harvard because I remember that when he says you're a Harvard professor, you can say it in a nice accent. So can you give that? Can you give that for us? The only correction we have is that it's actually the Harvard Business School. We don't just say yeah. Harvard, we say the Harvard Business School. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh so I'll I'll give kind of the 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 personal Mike is one of the most uh creative academics that I've come across. Um if I were to pick a top three person to say we have a problem uh and we're looking for interesting interventions to solve that problem, I would phone a friend with um, Mike Norton. And so i uh, very grateful that he's coming to uh, let us know kind of what his latest thinking is on rituals. Um, if you don't know now, you know that he also has other books or a book, uh, Happy Money, which is the science of happiness. So that would be a starter uh, thing for you to get on the Mike Norton train of uh, fandom. Um, and this is generally about how to use your money uh, in ways that make you uh, happier or or maybe not, maybe less, less sad. I don't know. Um, and uh, generally, this is going to be a very nice session where we'll hear a little bit from Mike and then we'll have a Q&A. So the tee up here is for folks to be thinking about questions that you'd want to ask. We'll hopefully have a very nice discussion um, where we'll hear um, from the Harvard professor. Who's also a tiger and he received his PhD in social psychology from Princeton University. We thought we'd give you your New Jersey creds as well, Mike. Um, with that, um, we will drop a link to his new book in the chat. Adam Grant likes it. You should too. Um, so, so welcome again to our Ration Labs community event. We are thrilled to have you. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to stop screen sharing. And Michael, you can take the wheel. I will. Let me um, grab this. Is that working? Can you see um, my screen? It's, it's dark right now, but Perfect. I mean, okay, that's good. That's that's a lot of drama you just did. That is a lot of drama. Nicely done. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, uh, uh, all of you. Thank you both for the intro. Uh, I have known Kristen for a disturbingly long time, so it's nice. <laughs> it means we're old, but it's nice to see you. And um, thanks, everybody, for um, joining today. So I'm going to talk for a little while about... Um, some of the research we've been doing on rituals for quite a long time now. And then I'd like to leave lots of time for um, Q&A. Typically, it's more as a topic, rituals are, people often have lots of questions like, what is a ritual? Where are they in my life? Um, do you have advice on them and things like that? So I'd, I'd like to leave lots of time for that. But I do want to talk about some of the research that we've done, um, thinking about how they play a role in our in our lives. But the first question, honestly, people usually ask is literally, what is a ritual? And when I think about rituals, I'm not typically studying the 
people in robes with candles <laughs> chanting kind of rituals, although those are fascinating and play really important roles in our lives for sure. I'm talking about often a different kind of ritual that we can get into that is often like smaller in scale and often something that we've come up with ourselves um, rather than received it or inherited it as a tradition. But the first question is to kind of start to tease these two apart is just this. So if you think for yourself um, in the morning when you're getting ready to leave or at night when you're getting ready for bed, do you brush your teeth first and then take a shower or do you take a shower and then brush your teeth? So think like which of those things do you do? You do? In the world, if I ask this question to lots of different people, about half of people say they brush their teeth first and then they shower. And about half of people say they shower and then brush their teeth. Some people say they do them at the same time. And that's disgusting. <laughs> so, don't, so stop doing that. No, that's fine. Do whatever you want. But it is actually strange to me that humans have not decided like brushing and then showering is the optimal order. We have 50-50 split more or less on this. So think about that for yourself, which one you do. And now the more important question for what Michael, there is also um if you ask the dental, dental and brushing, it's the same, by the way. 50-50 will say they dent before they brush, and 50 will say they brush before they dent. So. Very, very interesting. We have these all these interesting little habit y ritual things that uh but it's th this is a, I talked to a dentist once actually, and uh he was saying that you he can tell how you brush your teeth because when you start brushing your teeth, you're often like super excited and ready to really get your teeth clean. And then wherever you finish up, you're kind of like bored and just sort of brush your brush a little bit on it. And so you can actually, he could see in my mouth exactly how I brush my teeth, which is sort of disturbing uh, and a little bit magical. But anyway, so um, question is, um, whatever, whichever one you do, brush, shower, shower, then brush. If I ask you to flip the order, so think about, you know, if, if it's your nighttime thing, think about if you're a brush teeth and then shower person. If I said no, tonight or tomorrow morning, I want you to shower and then brush your teeth. Or if you're a shower, then brush person. Think about if I said no, no, tomorrow or tonight, you have to brush your teeth and then shower. And the question is, um, does that make you feel anything or not? And just like the question between which order is about 50-50, the answer to this is also about 50-50, meaning about half of people say, I couldn't care less, happy to flip them, happy to do whatever. And about half of people say, I'd rather not. And they say, I would feel weird. They use words like weird, uncomfortable. I would feel off. It wouldn't feel right to do it in that order. And if I ask why, they can't usually articulate why. It's not like a efficiency thing typically or something like that it's just this feeling that the, the order that i do them i would just rather do them in that order than in the other order and for me that starts to get at the difference between habits and rituals now again i don't mean rituals like people in robes chanting that's further out on the continuum but if you're someone who does these two activities you know you have to clean your teeth clean your body that's a habit it's a good habit cleanliness is good we, we should all have good habits but they're kind of um tasks that you're doing to get them done. There's not a lot else in them. It's just things that you're doing. But if you care, if you start to care about things like the order in which these things happen or the exact time at which they happen, that's when they're moving a little bit from not just kind of a dry habit, but something that's a little bit more ritualistic, meaning it has more emotion in it and it has more meaning in it. There's a, if you feel good when you do it your way, you feel off when you can't do it your way, that means that the, you've invested these really simple actions that don't in themselves really mean much. You've invested them with something a little bit more than that. And so one of the ways I think about it is kind of habits are the what, it's what we're doing, and rituals are how we do them, which is a much more psychologically rich um, approach. So even things like how you tie your shoes, everybody ties their shoes because you have to, well, if, if your shoes have laces, you tie your shoes. But some people do it in a very specific way and other people couldn't care less. They just need to tie their shoes. So even on these little tiny behaviors, you can see that for some of us, it's just what we're doing. And for other people, they're bringing a little bit of the, like, this is how I do it. Or as we'll talk about, this is how we do it. And sometimes this is how we do it and they're not doing it in the right way. Even though the actions themselves aren't necessarily meaningful, we imbue them with meaning and we imbue them with emotion, which can have great consequences or sometimes can have trickier consequences that we'll 
um, talk about. So I think about habits. Are, I mean, I'm not like an anti-habit person. I wish I had better habits. We should all have good habits. But if you think about if you had a life of perfect habits, so imagine you had, you know, 12 habits that you wanted to do, like exercising and eating and getting up at this time and all this stuff. And you executed them perfectly every single day of your life. Like for 40 years, you never skipped anything or missed anything in your habits. You'd probably be super healthy, but would that have been like an interesting, rich, psychologically varied life that you would look back on and say, I led a full life? Or would you say, I kind of was like a robot. You could have just filmed me on a loop and I would have looked the same every day. And there again, I think there's nothing wrong with having good habits. I, I wish I had them too, again. But rituals sometimes are a way of taking that automatic sort of robotic behavior and again, imbuing it with a little bit more meaning or a little bit more emotion. And the idea is that they allow us sometimes to have bigger and different experiences and bigger and different emotions than if we just treat everything like a dry, boring habit. So I started out studying this of all places from reading this, this particular book. This was um, the then president of Harvard, Drew Gilpin Faust, who's an historian. And she was studying um, rituals of grief, particularly in the American Civil War. And one of the things that she showed in her research is that, so in the American South in particular, the um, casualty rate was so enormously high that women in the South typically lost not just one close family member, but several close male family members, you know, their husband and their brothers and their cousins and their nephews, you know, was th that was the scale of the loss. And the question was, what does a culture do when they're faced with unprecedented loss and grief? And cultures have things that they do, every culture really, in a sense that we have recorded history of, does something with grief. It varies quite a bit. So in some cultures, black is the appropriate color to wear. In other cultures, white is the appropriate color to wear. If you wore the wrong color in the wrong culture, extremely offensive. But most importantly, it's just we've decided, different cultures, that this is how we grieve. There's this amazing thing. I was looking at this estate planning website, and they had this very specific color palette for what you're allowed to wear and not allowed to wear to a funeral. This is in the United States. So like very specific prescribed rules about what you can and can't do in order to grieve appropriately. But that's like the world as it is now. So what happens again when you have unprecedented grief? You can't be wearing black all the time. Maybe you have to change things with all this loss. And what she shows in her research is that in the American South, women uh, would come up with new rituals. So they had existing ones. And then they said, in the face of this, let's do something different. And what they did, and I, by the way, I don't mean they all got together and thought it out. It emerges from the culture. Rituals often just come out of groups and end up being something that we all practice. But what they did was they said, well, let's wear black for a little while and then gray for a little while. And then you can add a little bit of color, like a lavender ribbon. And then you can go back to dressing the way you would normally dress. So already they're kind of free. There's no 2000 year old text that says lavender. Culturally, they're coming up with something new. But for me, I mean, I'm a psychologist by training. What was so interesting is that the amount of time you spent on each phase depended on how close you were to the person who died. So I don't have the numbers exactly right, but think about it as, you know, if it was your husband, it's a year, a year, a year in the lavender, and then you can go back. But if it was your cousin who you're not as close with, it was a month, a month, and a month. Again, those aren't the correct numbers, but just to get an idea, they calibrated this brand new ritual. They calibrated it along the lines of what you think the grief would last for. And nobody, there was no committee to do it. It just emerges out of that. For me, that I mean, it's incredibly interesting how they emerge culturally. But for me, the thing that really struck me was that people are freelancing their rituals. They're, we're not only receiving the kind that are in the books. We're also receiving, we're also generating our own all the time. And so we started to wonder, I wonder if people do this in more domains than just that. We think about the kind that are inherited, but maybe we're coming up with our own weird ones all the time. I mean, weird affectionately, just to be clear, not as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. So when we ask people, you know, think about somebody you lost, what did you do? People will say, of course, you know, there was a funeral. It lasted for however many days that faith, you know, could be one day, three days, five days, a month. Different faiths have different ways of dealing um, with grief. 
But then people often said something else that they did specifically that was very idiosyncratic to the person they lost to honor that person. So one person, this always stuck out to me. This person said, I washed a loved one's car once a week, just as they had done while alive. I hate to belabor it, but there's obviously no thousand year old text that says to wash a car because there were no cars a thousand years ago. This person, but you can see exactly in the sentence what happened. The person who died had a car that they loved and probably took really good care of. And this person said, I'm going to keep the car and take care of it in the way that this person took care of it. It's a really lovely, on the one hand, you could say, why would you wash a car that you're not going to drive? On the other hand, of course, if you're a human, you can see how meaningful this was. And you often see this, that there's like a punctuated event culturally, like a funeral, but grief doesn't go away. You know, you don't have a one day funeral and now you're not grieving. People will often come up with their own rituals over time to kind of fill in these spaces that are still there for us. And it's not just, this is, by the way, the saddest part of the talk. So let's move to a happier part. It's not just with funerals. So we have weddings. When we love somebody, we get married. We literally call one of the fingers on our hand, the ring finger. Like that's how important rings and weddings are to the humans. Like the middle finger is called that usefully because it's in the middle. Ring doesn't mean, you know, you wouldn't know which finger it was, but we decided this finger, all that's used for is put this stuff on it. So we have weddings. They, again, they vary widely from culture to culture, but typically people get together who love the couple and there's some sort of a ceremony. But then, you know, your wedding's over and you go home back to your apartment or wherever you're, whatever you're doing. And so what do you do after that? Well, we have like Valentine's Day where we're supposed to be nice to our partner. We have our anniversary once a year. That's something where we're supposed to be nice to each other again. But what do you do on all of the other days? You could do nothing, but some couples come up with their own little rituals. So when we ask couples, is there anything, you know, you and your partner do that's special that you make sure to do repeatedly that means a lot to you? About a, a third to a quarter of couples say no, but the majority of couples say, actually, you know what, we do have something. And here's some very adorable ones. This person said, when we kiss, we do it in threes. Not sure why this started, but after 22 years, it feels really weird if it is not in threes. And this one I totally love. When my partner and I eat dinner, we always clink our silverware together. So they're taking, like, what's more boring than a fork? You know, it's, it's literally just a thing to stab and put in your mouth. They've turned this really boring thing, almost like brushing your teeth and showering. They're not interesting, but you turn them into something that has meaning. And we can see correlationally that couples that have these kinds of rituals report higher relationship satisfaction than couples who don't have these rituals. We haven't been able to do the thing where we go out in the world and randomly assign couples to have a ritual or not, you know, for 12 years and see what happens to their divorce. That would be amazing. If anybody has a way for us to do that, we'd love to do it. But at least we see observationally that these are a signal of something about the relationship when we engage in these little behaviors um, together. So uh, grief, romantic relationships, hugely also in parenting. I want to show you a bunch of the domains that we've looked at to give you a sense of for me anyway, how widespread our use of rituals is. So for parenting, um, sometimes people will say, I don't, uh, maybe people on this call in fact will say, I don't have any rituals. Uh, I don't do that kind of stuff. Like I'm not a new agey millennial. You know, I don't go to Santa Fe and have crystals and stuff like that. So rituals are not for me. I was probably along those lines for most of my life. Um, but, but if anybody has had a kid, you know that when a kid comes home with you, you're responsible for the kid, like forever. It's very, very, very stressful. And parents will naturally turn to ritual as one of the solutions. So if you ask parents, like when you brought the, the baby home, what did you start doing to try to help the baby to sleep? And people have the most insanely elaborate rituals that they come up with, including me, by the way, with our daughter, which are like, well, we did this song and then we did this book and then this song and then two more of these books. And then we had this stuffed animal followed by this stuffed animal. And then we turned this light on like this and this other, I mean, really, really elaborate sorts of things in, in an effort to try to help the kid get to sleep. And every couple or parent is coming up with it themselves. They're freelancing it. But fundamentally, they're saying, I'm super stressed. Let's do something to try to help our kid to sleep. It's not clear if it helps the kid to sleep, but I think it definitely helps the parents to feel like... They have some sense of control over what's you, going on. You in call their it a lives. ritual and not a habit. Or did Sorry, you... say that again. You call it a ritual and not a habit. By the way, I'm also a, 
having a newborn, so handling the same, struggling. Me, it is you, because you it call is. those rituals because they're um, you have intention behind them, and they're not a habit. I think for me, partly what it is is they're not really required. So, for example, we don't know what we need to do to have our kids sleep is put them in a crib. Technically speaking, you know that's what's required to have a kid go to bed. But what we do is we add all of these actions that in the belief that they are helping our kid to sleep. We typically don't test them. So you don't see parents saying, you know what, for the next month, let's try a different book every single night and then calculate which one was the most effective for sleep. That doesn't tend to be how we do it. We develop these rituals kind of over time organically in an effort to help us with the kind of stress that we're undergoing. So they're, they're often actions that they're not required in the sense that they're not the thing itself, but we add on to them and we make them meaningful in order to try to accomplish some other goal um, that we might have. And we even did research during um, COVID. Uh, this is with Jim and Nam and Jimena Garcia Rada, where we asked parents how they were handling parenting during COVID. And what we find is that many, many parents introduced new rituals. Even parents that had not had rituals with their kids before COVID, introduce new rituals during COVID. These are just a couple of, of the ones that people told us about. I really like this 10-minute um, silly moment wiggles kind of thing, because you could do that at any point with your kids whenever you want. But when the world got crazy, many parents turned, just like with your kid can't sleep when it's, you know, they're a newborn, when the world is making everything stressful, people also turn to rituals there as well. And we do see that parents who report ritual new rituals with their kids during COVID feel a little better about their parenting, even controlling for whether they were doing rituals with their kids before. So it isn't just that parents who have rituals like their kids more, it does feel like there's something being added correlationally, but something being added when we start these new rituals. All right, so we get funerals, uh, weddings, <laughs> parenting, these are big, big things in our lives that, that happen to us. But still, still many people are like, I don't, I don't do rituals. I like, I don't like rituals. So the question is, um, if you're one of those people, have you ever been sitting at a table and somebody has made a cake and they very carefully frosted the cake to look extremely good, like perfectly frosted, no, nothing showing, you know, everything's really nice. And then before they bring the cake over, they stick wax candles in it and light them on fire so that wax drips all over the cake then sing a very tuneless song with a bunch of other people. That sounds kind of like a funeral <laughs> dirge. Then they bring it over and put it down in front of you. You then blow all over the cake. Like I have a cold right now. This isn't usually a good, we don't usually have people blow on our food before we eat the food. And then you make a wish, you know, everybody claps and then you cut the cake and eat it with the wax and the spit from the blowing on it. Of course, um, belaboring it but obviously we do birthday cakes all it is is food but we turn it into something much much more than food it doesn't make a lot of sense if our goal is caloric intake adding wax and germs is not a great way to do it if our goal is to celebrate something i mean the number of candles tell us you are moving from who you were to who you are going to become and we're showing you visually that's what's happening Many or most people have had uh, cakes like this. And if you don't have a birthday cake ever or whatever the, the food, traditional food is in your culture, there's often some food associated with birthday. Think about this. Have you ever been drinking a liquid in a cup? And instead of just drinking the liquid in a cup, you raise the cup and smash it against other people's cups, also filled with liquid, and say one or two words and then drink the liquid. And of course, the answer is yes. Many people have done that. Here's some of the things from different languages all over the world. Typically, they mean, you know, cheers, uh, health, luck, life. Most of the words have something to do with this. It's just liquid in a glass. But when we pick the glass up, like spilling the thing out, which isn't a good idea or whatever, what we're doing is, of course, celebrating something else. And again, this is amazing that rituals let us do is they just let us take a cake or liquid in a, in a glass and turn it into something that's much, much more meaningful than that. We don't need like special ingredients even, you know, we can use what we can use silverware in order to create some of these um, emotions and, and some of these memories. And of course, I used to be, I'm not in marketing anymore, but I used to be in marketing. But if you look 
uh, in the world, brands are super onto this now. They know that we like the word ritual. There's like seven different companies called Ritual. One, there's like a skincare one. I think there's a non-alcoholic beverage company that's called Ritual or something like that. So they're onto us that we really like this word Ritual. For me, I think it's like, let's not let the marketers tell us what the rituals are, but maybe we can come up with our own um, as well. Okay. So this is the point at which people are often like, why does this guy work at a business school if he's studying like funerals <laughs> and things like that? So of course, we also look sometimes at what happens uh, at work with rituals. And it turns out there that they're all over the place um, also. So if you think about performance before a big meeting, before a big, pre big presentation, what do people do in order to get ready? Here's not quite a meeting, but somebody who's very stressed and has to do something very difficult. Does so anybody know who this is describing? You can unmute and just shout it. Nobody knows? I don't believe it. I know. Who? Tennis player? Um, Rafa Nadal. Rafa Nadal. He does, this is, by the way, only part of his pre-serve. This isn't, uh, by the way, pre-match. This is before every single serve. He does this extremely elaborate uh, kind of thing. And he even has specific ones for second serve. So he's decided why why bother touching my shoulders in the second serve? It's not, it's not needed there. And if you think about, you know, like what is he doing? He himself says, it's just like brushing your teeth and shout. You, you know that it, you know, it's not gonna kill you to do it in the opposite order. And he says, it's I know it's something I don't need to do, but when I do it, I feel really focused. Part of his um, ritual is he picks his wedgie uh, each time. And so GQ said he's the most famous underwear adjuster in history. Of all the things that I've talked about in my research, this is the only one that my daughter has ever found interesting. So if you need something to just tell your kids they'll find interesting, it's that professional athletes pick their wedgies. So Nadal is not us, obviously, and we don't necessarily do these incredibly elaborate rituals. In fact, we allow high performers to engage in these sorts of behaviors. And we just say, I guess they're allowed to do that. If I did that before I started teaching, or if I did this before, you know, at the beginning of this webinar, you'd think I'd lost my mind. I'm not allowed to do it. But in these really high stress situations, we are allowed to do it publicly. But for the rest of us, we do it privately, actually, when we ask people, you know, what do you do when you're nervous? This is a harder one, but does anybody happen to know what TV show character was saying this to himself? There's no prize, but I'm just curious. Ready? It's Jack Donaghy. <laughs> He's got to give him a big presentation. Goes in the bathroom, yells at himself in the mirror. His mic is on, so everybody hears this, so it's super embarrassing. But many, many people say something like, yeah, I go into the bath. I go in the bathroom, I check to make sure nobody's in there because we're not in the doll. We're not allowed to be weird. And I say something to myself in the mirror. About half of people, by the way, say... If they're talking to themselves in their head, they say, I can do this. And about half of people say, you can do this. You can think for yourself which type of person you are. The you can do this people are so interesting to me because who's talking to who when you say to yourself, you can do this. But anyway, very, very common that that regular people like us also engage in these um, rituals right before we have to do something very stressful. It's not just individual at work. We also see lots of team rituals at work as well. You're probably familiar with the Hakka. This is something that the New Zealand All Blacks started to do before their um, matches. At work, we don't typically do rituals like this. But when we ask people at work, you know, is there any, almost like with couples, is there anything special that you do together that's different from other couples that, that is unique and is important to you? I could say the same thing about teams. Some teams say, nope. And other teams say, um, yeah. There is actually, this is one from a team. It's not the Hakka, but you can see what they're doing. Every day we order lunch, we cycle five restaurants. You can see how orderly it is, by the way, like this, then this, then this, then this. That's already a bit of a ritualistic um, flair. But what they do here is each person takes a day of the week for lunch. And what they're allowed or allowing themselves to do there is every day, one person is taking care of the other people on the team. 
And then the next day, another person's taking care of everyone on the team. They pay each other back and stuff like that, but but that's not really the point, right? The point is that they do this thing together. They've been doing it for a while. They're doing it today, and they're going to keep doing it in the future. Other people, when we say, is there anything special? <laughs> they have nothing. So this guy, you can think of the person in your organization who is this person, but just says, I don't participate in any other activity. I've been working on I go home. Michael, Again, so though, correlationally, when we ask these um, teams, how meaningful is your job to you? How meaningful is your work to you? We see that people who say they have these team rituals, not only do they see the team ritual as meaningful, but it bleeds over a little bit into seeing their job and their work as more meaningful as well. In this case, we can actually do experiments in the lab and randomly assign teams, brand new teams, to do rituals that are more or less ritualistic. And there also we see some evidence that the, when you do things that are more ritualistic, you see them as more meaningful. And that meaning, again, can then translate onto the meaning you see in the work that you're doing next. This is a case, like with couples, it's very hard to do the random assignment, you know, to a, a romantic relationship. With teams, we're a little bit more able to do it, at least in a, you know, laboratory uh, sort of setting. Okay. Um, we, in one of the experiments, we have people actually do a ritual similar to this. So, you know, we have people come into our laboratory, they get in groups of three to five, we have them do these rituals in synchrony. And they tend to work in the sense that when we've done this all together and stomped, we tend to then feel more like a unit than if we haven't done this. That's a good, I've been focusing a lot on the positive benefits of when rituals happen. But I also want to say, and I said at the beginning, they're not always just great. They can come with costs as well. So in another line of research, we look to see um, not just can they bring us together, but what do our rituals do and our feelings about other people who might be doing it differently? Because sometimes it's not just that our rituals feel good to us, it's that they feel right. And when they move from feeling good to feeling right, it means that other people are therefore doing it wrong. And there is a huge source of conflict. And so imagine you know, you're doing this in lockstep, and then some teams all of a sudden do this, and other teams all of a sudden do this. You were you were getting along so well with the clapping and stomping, and now you're doing it wrong. And that is literally the feeling people have. Those other people are doing it wrong. And we can see in our experiment that actually you become less trusting of people solely on the basis of the fact that they're engaged in a ritual that's slightly different from yours. And I wanted to highlight this because um, it, it is not the case that just if you add a whole bunch of rituals, things are great. Rituals are really powerful psychologically. And whenever something's really powerful psychologically, it can do great things for us. And it can also have harmful consequences as well. And this is a case where you get like in-group love is terrific. But if it leads to out-group hate, then we start to be concerned about which rituals we should be using and which we should be emphasizing um, or not. <laughs> Um, last thing that I'll talk about, and then I just want to switch to Q&A, is um, rituals and work-life balance. So um, we do rituals in the morning, like toothbrushing to get ready for work. When we're stressed at work, before meetings, we do stuff. We do things in our teams. But the another big question is, how do we separate work from home? So I need to go from professional self to home self, like professor to dad, for example. Those are not the same role. So how do people insert something in the middle in order to try to get that space. And of course, one of the things that people do is rituals. We did some research with emergency room nurses. I think that's, I don't have like the data, but I emergency room nurse has to be one of the most stressful jobs ever. You know, maybe air traffic controller. I'm not sure what's more stressful. Very long shifts, very emotional, very draining. And then you're supposed to kind of just like leave the hospital and go home and be right back to your regular self, you know, just cut it off. And here we are. So many of these emergency room nurses, when we say, what do you do at the end of the day? They tell us something pretty, we don't say what ritual do you do? We just say, what do you do to leave work behind? And they tell us things that are very ritualistic. This person I love, when they're showering, they imagine the entire hospital turning into liquid and circling down the drain. And once it's all down the drain, they can try to leave work behind. Another person did something similar, but they added, they had a beer. So they bring <laughs> beer into the shower with them also to try to leave work behind. I can't endorse drinking alcohol in the shower, but... You can see what people are trying to do here. They're, they're trying to separate, leave one thing behind so they can enter another thing. Very, very common that we see that. And again, nurses who report doing these sorts of ritualistic behaviors do report being slightly better able to leave work behind with things like 
they use words like I can unwind and I can decompress um, when they have rituals, whereas nurses that don't have rituals are less likely to have these sorts of feelings of separation. And then the last thing that I'll show you, because I just think it's funny, is so during COVID, COVID is not funny, I'm sorry, but what, how people reacted to having to work from home, because many people had a commute before that, where that's natural separation between work and home. You get a little buffer in between. When you work from home, suddenly you're working two feet from where you sleep. It makes the challenge even harder for how do we separate our work self from our home self. This is um, a column, is sort of funny column. So she, so she said, I'm hungry for ritual. Every day I get dressed, put on shoes, make coffee, pour it in a mug, tell my housemates that I'm headed to work and we'll see him later. Then I walk a few circles and sit at a desk in the corner of our living room, just a couple feet away. Another person that uh, we came across uh, was a, a cyclist, used to you know bike to work and back every day. So he started leaving his bedroom, putting on biking gear, hopping on his bike, biking down his hallway, getting off his bike, taking his biking gear off, putting his work clothes on and working. And then at the end of the day, work clothes off, biking clothes on, bike back down the hallway, you know, to the bedroom and do it in, in reverse. On the one hand, you could say this person's lost their mind. On the other hand, how else are you supposed to separate work from home when you're literally stuck in the exact same place? I think it's very interesting that when we're faced with it, almost like these in American Civil War dealing with grief, in COVID as well, we're faced with these new problems, these new stresses. And very often we turn to coming up with our own new rituals in an effort to address some of those new um, challenges, which I think for me, that that's what made it so interesting is I started out with what is a ritual, but after a while it became sort of like, what isn't a ritual? Because it is a topic where you you, meaning me, kind of start to see them every single place that you look in life. We've done lots of domains, but I think that there are many, many more. And I think for me, the the key thing is um, that sometimes the message could be like, you know, oh, add, as I said, like add a hundred rituals and you'll be so happy. But that's not typically how I think about it. What I think about is um, see where they already are in your life. Even as I've been speaking, you might have been thinking like, oh, I actually do have a little morning coffee thing that I do, or, you know, my team actually does do this sort of thing. I think it's interesting to just notice where they already are happening in life. We developed this little, it's very quick, this little rituals quiz, which just kind of quizzes you in different domains of your life. Um, so you can see like, are you high or low in individual rituals or high or low in team rituals and things like that, and give you a little feedback um, if you feel like pursuing that. But otherwise, that is all I have. Thanks so much for listening. And I'm very excited to take questions. Great. Okay. Um, you know, we're moving into another stage. And so like, what should our ritual be to move into another stage? Should we be like clap, clap? Or should everyone right now take themselves off mood and we clap? Yes. Okay. Sure. That would be gratifying. Okay. One, two, three, we're all doing this together. Can't hear anything. It's terrible. So not only to say thank you to Mike, but also to move us to another stage and Maybe a rationale will, well, actually, maybe we'll kick off with my question is a very selfish um, thing. We have lots in the chat, but let's say I'm an HR manager, hiring manager, I have a team and I'm just an extrovert and I want to introduce, or I like this idea so much of rituals. I believe it. I'm with you. How would, how would I, do I just tell my team we're starting to stomp or like, what's the move? So the worst thing is um, very often how to say there there's a manager that employees hate who is the manager that over the weekend watched a ted talk or listened to a motivational podcast <laughs> and comes to work on monday and says like we're gonna do it this way you know from now on we're something so every meeting's gonna be six minutes because i heard a thing or whatever it might be typically the top down kind don't go over very well and the reason for that and what you get is like a collective eye roll now in a funny way that isn't the worst thing because actually everyone is synchronously rolling their eyes at the same time and bonding. So it's not terrible for creating like good bonding between people. It just comes at your expense as a manager because they hate you. And yes, the office is totally amazing for, for all of these things with Michael Scott. So when we do this, what we do is we go to teams themselves and say, why don't you take a little bit of time to think about what the things are that you already do that make you unique? and start there. One of the things that's very fun is how about inside jokes that you have or phrases that you use that other teams don't use. Mm -hmm. And you, you start to 
hear teams be like, well, actually, you know what we do is, and they'll come up with these little funny things that they do. They often have specific ways of starting meetings or ending meetings. So I like to try to take, allow people to make them themselves, basically. It doesn't, the way that, um, it's a little frustrating, but it isn't the case that we can say things like, if you do six claps and four stomps, that that works. You know what I mean? Five claps doesn't work, but six does. That's not typically how, if, I, if we discovered things like that, that would be quite interesting, but that's not typically how humans work. It's not like a one size fits all. So if it comes up from the team or from the group or from the romantic couple or from the family or whatever it might be, those tend to already have some elements of our identity in them. And they're easier to build into something that doesn't lead to eye rolling, but leads maybe to us feeling, you know, differently about each other. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to take now Chris's question, which is basically, let's say you're effective at doing this. There's no eye rolls. People have a, a ritual that bonds them. Your, uh, there was a study you said where you got teams and you kind of intercepted um, and you gave them rituals and they, they were better off. How long, and you can kind of say, we don't know or guess, but how long would an effect like this last? There's a funny thing. So when um, you do things with teams at work, the intervention um, doesn't necessarily last a long time. So what I'm thinking about, we we did um, uh, years ago, we did research on um, giving gifts to each other in the workplace. When we were doing research on how giving uh, giving money makes you happier sometimes than spending it on yourself, we would do research in organizations where we would have employees buy gifts for other people on their team. And when you get a gift, you feel kind of happy. And we we try to show when you give a gift, you feel kind of happy. But it's not like if I give you a gift and you're happy, that you're going to stay happy for the rest of your life. That's like not how humans work. Nor am I going to be so happy that I gave it to you for the rest of my life. So those feelings are going to just decline because that's how humans work. But what doesn't decline is the fact that we had an exchange where I did something nice for you. And now I'm that guy that did a nice thing for you. And you're that person that I did a nice thing for. And that's lasting. You know, that actually changed. We're, we're never going to not be those people again. And so those things actually can last. It's not that the intervention itself is going to keep you, you know, where you were after the intervention. But with social interventions, what you can sometimes do is change the dynamic in a more permanent way with an initial thing that the, the specific effect might wear off but the relationship might be changed over time. So we don't know for sure, to answer your question all the way back, we don't know for sure, but I do think when you structure things that change in our personal dynamics, they have a better shot at having a little bit longer term effect than if you just have people in isolation and you treat them with some experiment or something like that, of course, that's very likely to decline quickly. Got it. That's great. Um, I'm going to switch to Sharon's question. She asked one up front and then reiterate it. And I, I, I do like it, which is just how I'm going to kind of broaden it, Sharon, which is like, how do brands, how should brands think about this research? So again, they're bought in. They're like, yes, I get it. I, rituals are powerful part of people's lives. And so they're probably thinking, should I cr try to create a ritual or turn a habit into a ritual? Like what is, if you're, if you're a marketing person at a consumer company, what do you do hearing this, this work? One thing that is super fun is to actually um, observe what consumers are already doing around consumption and see if there's anything interesting in it. So, so for example, um, Oreos is amazing. You know, it's just like a cookie, but they have this incredible culture of twisting the thing off and dunking in the thing. And then you eat the thing. And many people are like, well, do you eat the filling first and then dunk it? Or do you dunk and then eat the fill? You know, I mean, there's this like very elaborate series of rituals around how you eat Oreos. And lots of products and things have something like that in them and the way that people consume them. And so it isn't so much necessarily like make a ritual and print it on the package, like twist it three times and then eat it, something like that. Although you saw Stella Artois kind of tries to do that. But observing what people are naturally doing in the wild, I think, is often a super interesting way to think about it. The other thing that comes to mind is um, I used to teach a case on um, beauty products. And, and um, what you see is like, um, this is like completely exaggerated, but basically for X number of years in human history, there's like no soap. People are like, I'm good. And then, and then at some point, humans are like, soap, maybe we'll have soap, but it's just one kind. 
So you just like use the soap and then you're clean. And then at some period after that, people are like, but wait, like the face is different from the body. So you're like, we should have two soaps. And then later on, people are like, well, hands are different from arms and faces. So we need three. So I'm making all this up of three soaps. And then it's like, well, actually, cheeks are quite different from foreheads. So we need four. And then it's like, well, the chin needs its own. So you can see like this insane <laughs> exponential growth of soaps or beauty products more broadly. And that is, I mean, in a way, like cynically, if you think about it, marketers are like, what else can we add to the morning routine <laughs> so that people will add a step? And we can sell them like another product, like left eyelid, right eyelid. Maybe we can have a product for each of those. And what's cool about the curves is it happens exponentially for women earlier. And now men are on the same upswing. So it was like ran out of things to do <laughs> with female consumers. And so it switched to men. And if we're all human. Men are like, maybe I need one for my left eyelid too. So now you see this kind of increase over here. Totally. So I think there are ways to think about building in ritual. I but, I felt like all the things I put on my face are are correct, and that's. But you're telling you're telling me it's it's a ritual. By the way, if, if I think about that from a you, we sell knives like, and then you have cheese knives. It's like it's the same it's the same thing, but cutting cheese is a very special thing, and you need to do it you know with your cheese knife. And so it, this does seem like a a marketer's um, opportunity is to get us to think differently about each step of the process, and then if you have bread and cheese you have to have a bread knife and a cheese knife wow two wow. for two it's pretty good that is that's really good <laughs> really good um okay so we've got ryan's asking a question here and and i'm gonna i think what he's asking you to do is to pick a fight with habits so this is what he's saying is is there any this is not what he's saying that's what i'm saying but is there any evidence that creating a ritual is more effective at changing behavior than creating a habit and so I know you've kind of said they're different, they're the same, but like what if you had to pick one, what do you, who do you pick? Who do you pick? So there's a trick um, this is gonna sound like a dodge, but I don't mean it as a dodge at all, which is that um habits and rituals can look exactly the same. It's not that there are different movements necessarily or different sequences in them. And what I mean by that is even so even if you think about observing a religious ritual any religious service that you might go to. I'm Irish Catholic, so I know the movements associated with the Catholic mass, but each religion has its own um, movements that are have specific meaning for that faith. But if you observe people practicing religion, some of the people there are practicing their faith in a very deep way that connects them to generations of their family, that connects them to spirituality, you know, that's incredibly moving and meaningful for them and hugely important in their lives. And other people are there because their parents made them go. But I can't tell the difference because if I'm watching, everybody's doing the exact same thing. And it's true also if you're brushing your teeth and showering. For, for one person, they couldn't care less what order they do them in. And for somebody else, their whole day would be completely weird if they switched the order. But I can't see it until I ask. And it's actually very frustrating because it means that we can't, like observational research is so awesome because you learn so much from just looking. But when it's about meaning and emotion and things like that, you know, we could try to code people's facial expressions and things like that, but we actually need to see what's happening under the surface, which means it isn't so much like um, rituals are better than habits or not. It's often just like the same behaviors can either be dry or they can have more emotion and more meaning in them. And it isn't better or worse because, as I said, you know, if you have a, a ritual of, I hate to come back to this, but it's so silly I keep using, it, is the toothbrushing and showering. It's true that if you do it in the order that you wanted to do it, you feel good. That's a reward, but there's risk to it, which is if it gets flipped or disrupted, now you feel off. So it's not better to have a ritual than just to have a habit. It's just different in the sense that they're more emotional, which can be good or bad for you. So the very, very long answer to say, I don't know which makes them stickier because I have to ask like each person, what do these specific things mean to you to try to figure out what might be make the most sense for them? I'm sure there's a clever way to study that that I haven't thought of. So if, if anybody knows, actually, I would love to hear. It. So basically we're saying we like in general, the rituals are more about the underlying meaning and yes, this could make them stickier, but honestly, it's it's going to kind of really depend on kind of the, the inner workings 
of, of you to think about how much meaning and purpose. And there's also downsides to rituals because if they're disrupted, you're annoyed, upset, and you just, you just, where's the cheese knife? Um, that's right. If you have your lucky running shoes, you know, and that's going to help you run every morning. Cause you're like, these are the ones, but then like you lose them. It, yeah. it wouldn't have been better to have lucky running shoes because now you're totally off your habit because now you're, you're disrupted. You know, you should have just had regular running shoes that you don't care about. You know what I mean? So it's, I'm sure in some sequences, it's better to have one or the other, but I'm not, I don't think I could do like a summary aha, definitely have this much of this and this much of that. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go off script here and ask you one question. If you could design any experiment with rituals that you haven't yet gotten to do, what would you, what would you do? So my, the, like, for me, the um, holy grail is family rituals because all families have, have rituals. So like in the U.S., Thanksgiving is a big, obviously family thing we're supposed to come from where we are and get together and um we can see in our research that if you say my family has rituals you're more likely to gather actually physically gather for that holiday than if you don't have rituals again it's correlational so maybe if you like your family you're more likely to have rituals obviously we don't know the answer to that and that's exactly what's so frustrating actually right is that we can't randomly assign families to have rituals i mean we could we could try but like we all know compliance etc cetera, etc cetera. and like how am i gonna get my brother to do anything even if i sign up for something so we have these huge um blind spots in a sense in the research on rituals because a lot of the coolest domains aren't amenable to experiment we can we can you know get very stylized with them in the lab and try to look at some process and, and some causality but most of the things that's like let's randomly assign this couple to have a 10 year ritual of clinking their silverware. And this one will just clink their silverware, but with no meaning like <laughs> amazing, right? We would learn so, so much from doing that. And we just get, as soon as you get to like history and tradition, it just, it's so hard to simulate that in the lab that we're just not able to do some of the cool, for me, what would be some of the coolest research actually. Yeah. Okay. But right now, let's say you get to give all of us. So, uh, uh, a ritual to take home with us. Um, this is, this could be clinking of the silverware. Do you want, and I know we're supposed to come up with it, but let's just, you're paternalistically telling us something to try either with our friends, family, or team. What, what do you tell us? I, know I would give it, give it to us. Yeah. If you're, so if you're somebody who's like, I don't, I still don't have any rich, I, like, yeah, I did a birthday cake, but I don't have any rituals. Um, ask your significant other, or your coworkers, or especially if you have children, like, hey, what am I up to? They're going to tell you stuff that you do that you're not even aware of, typically. That would be my first step, actually, is, is truly look at the things that you're already doing with a new lens and think about building them, building more into them. Like, for example, I was talking to a journalist who said, um, you know, it, I in the morning, I have tea every morning, but it's just tea. Like, I'm just having some tea to get some caffeine. And she said, I don't have any rituals. Like I'm not a ritual person. And I said, and she said, how would I make it more ritualistic was the similar question. And I said, well, I don't know you. Like I we're literally just on the phone. I've never even seen your face. So I have no idea. But I said, some people will, um, for example, a particular type of tea that has emotional resonance for them, or they'll always use the same mug. And maybe it was like their grandmother's mug and that has meaning for them. And she started to laugh. She was like, oh my God. I do use this. She remember she'd been like, no rituals for me, just tea. She said, Oh my God, I do use the same mug every morning. It's a mug that I got that has elephant seals on it. And I bought it when my daughter and I witnessed elephant seals giving birth. Wow. And she was like, I've used it every single time. And she said, last week, my husband brought me tea in the wrong mug. And I was like, take it away. <laughs> so you have this, these things that we are doing. And then, you know, then it's like, now she's aware of it. She was doing it anyway, but now when she does it, she's like, oh my God, this is the connection to my daughter. This, you know what I mean? So I'm not, I hate to be prescriptive, like go and do, you know, click a button six times and that'll be a nice ritual. I do think there's already things often that we're doing that they're there already, but noticing them can imbue them with a little bit more. Great. Um, okay, we have three minutes left. And so I'm going to do a couple wrap ups and then give you the final word. Word. We didn't get to some of the questions there. We had a couple questions on OCD with rituals and kind of the, the negative downside of rituals. So what I would suggest is just 
by Mike's book. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and maybe the downside of rituals will be in there because you always kind of have to. It is. Downside. Um, totally. and it is. In that book. Um, and so the, the, yeah, the, the takeaway here is, um, you know, we have language for a lot of things in behavioral science and in our world. And it seems like rituals is maybe something that we don't have enough language for. And Mike, I think the book is doing a lot to kind of add that idea. And probably from our personal and family life, we could do a lot. But when I first heard this, I was like, how would we apply this to a company? It's like very clear that I think from an HR perspective, this is like a really nice thought exercise for folks that your teams could actually create meaning and purpose around what they're doing and and kind of help bond the team, create identity and, and give some meaning and purpose to our day to day, which sometimes can be amazing and sometimes can be, you know, boring and average. And so rituals could probably help help uh, with each each team. Um, and so, yeah, a uh, short plug for Irrational Lab. So if you guys do, I think you probably got this because you're subscribed to our newsletter, you follow us on LinkedIn. So I'm probably talking to the crowd that already knows. But um, if you haven't, uh, we have a hot newsletter that Brad on the call uh, is, is, maybe we have a join link or something in there. Um, and we have lots of events and, and fun folks uh, coming to speak. So we would love more folks to come to, to these events and get kind of thought bubbles and, and go away thinking one new idea. Um, so with that, Mike, any wrap up, any wrap up thoughts? Just if you are trying to have a life of completely perfect habits, um, consider what it would be like to be dating or married to someone with perfect habits who <laughs> was completely inflexible. And maybe think about that there may be more than perfect habits, I guess, to, to having a, uh, a rich and interesting emotional life and perhaps not getting divorced. That, that's a nice, that's a nice, <laughs> there's, there's more to life than this, guys. Um, and on that note, I hope everyone has a great, uh, great day. Thanks, Mike. Uh, bye. Thank you, Kristen. Bye the book and we'll, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it.